All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Bo from Ace Lab. We are helping out with uh, hosting today's webinar presented by Monarch Metals. So I'm going to give folks a few minutes to join, give a quick little intro about Ace Lab and about myself, um, and then I'll hand it over to Jared, who's going to be leading our presentation. We also have Aaron from the Monarch team on with us today. Aaron's going to be here to answer any questions that you have. So please feel free to submit questions to the Q&A. Um, we will definitely have some time to get to them at the end of today's event. We'll also have a record of your questions so that we can follow up with you after the event if we do not get to it. All right, so to start out with a quick little intro about Ace Lab. So we are a platform that provides free non-sponsored product research. Um, here's a little snapshot of our team. So Ace Lab was started by architects um, with the goal to free up time so that we can spend more time designing better buildings and less time trying to track down product data or identify the right products. Um, so I'm also a former architectural designer. I got my master's in architecture at Tulane and uh, practiced in New York for a few years before joining onto the team at Ace Lab. Um, and I joined onto Ace Lab about exactly a year ago. Um, so it's been a really fun year full of a lot of growth um, and a lot of exciting developments. Um, so this is just kind of a little diagram example of some of the problems that, uh, you know, we all saw in practice, the reasons we came to Ace Lab. So just being able to track down your product information, get in touch with reps at the right times, being able to find products that used in projects on the past, um, so these are all problems that Ace Lab has been working to solve. So I'll head over to our live site to show you real quick how to find Monarch um, and a few things about how to save and store and organize your info on Ace Lab. So once you log in, you get a nice custom dashboard view. You can really easily pick up on your searches, save products, conversations, and your projects. Everything that's kind of your space is hosted over here in your library. So you can upload projects to organize your information. You can save products to a general product library. You can also save them under your project. So here I've got a bunch of product shortlists. You can see I've already saved some Monarch Metal products here. All of our searchable categories are in this dark blue bar at the top. You can check back to this other products category too, where we start uploading some newer products. And if you know exactly who you're looking for, you can always just type in the name of a manufacturer into this uh, dark blue bar at the top here. That'll start to auto-populate. You can head over to their brand page on Ace Lab, reach out to them directly from here. You can see an overview of you know, their main value props, um, videos, and explore their products right from this page as well. To save a product, all you have to do is hover over this little shortlist button. You can save that right to your project or save it to your products. You can also upload a new project right from this stage. So if you haven't done the setup work to get your project portal you know, set up and organized, you can always do that once you're already into the research flow. You can even view inspiration and something that's really great about using Ace Lab just to view different uh, manufacturers is that these pages are all organized the same. So you can always find the information that you're looking for in the same place. And that's the same with our product pages as well. So to open up one of these, these are also all organized the same across different uh, products and across different manufacturers. Um, so it can be really helpful to always just know where you can find your information and easily download files. I'll jump over here right back to my project to show you where those saved products lived. So to open up a short list, you just click on this and then you get a really handy comparison table where you have an overview of product information. You can reach out to reps and request information directly. And then this is also collaborative, so you can add comments back and forth. If you, you know, have a note from one of your team members that you want uh, folks to remember, it's really easy to add in that information so that you can add in your own kind of custom information to these overviews as well. All right, that takes care of my quick little intro. Thank you all for uh, staying tuned for that. And without further ado, we are gonna go ahead and get started with today's um, presentation on attachment systems for cladding panels. Um, so this is gonna be a really great live product training session and really excited to uh, bring this presentation to you all. So just a little reminder, uh, please feel free to submit your questions. We've got Aaron on deck so that he can answer those as they come up. And we'll also have time at the end for any of the questions that we do not get to throughout the presentation. All right, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Jared. Thanks, Bo. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, appreciate the introduction, Bo. Uh, like they said, I'm Jared. I'm with Monarch Metal, I'm Director of Sales. I have Aaron with me. Uh, he'll be hopping on for the Q&A if needed on uh, any technical questions. So we'll jump right into the uh, presentation.
what we're uh, going to be doing today is basically an overview of um, our different attachment systems, uh, as well as general cladding information on different types of panels. Uh, we see a lot of architects come to us asking uh, what kind of system they can use for uh, specific panels, sometimes not even knowing as much about the panels as, they, as they'd like to, or our systems as well. So we've made a general overview of those panels, uh, tying in later to our attachment systems as well. For some of you guys, this is going to be an introduction. For others, it's going to be a review of some cladding types. Later on, we'll get heavier into our attachment systems themselves. That way, everything ties back in together. So if you need a copy or anything after we get done, we can send that to you. And you can see a good flow between where the panels are and then our attachment systems as well. A brief introduction on the company. Uh, we've been around since the 80s. We were generally a Z-Clip company for years. Uh, that's our bread and butter. It's still the backbone of our business. Uh, our current owner took over in 2011. And after that, we started with an exterior focus uh, about six or seven years ago, heavier into the cladding space. So designing some products, uh, originally working with some manufacturers to design some concealed exposed fastener systems, and also trims. Uh, our CEO and new leadership were brought on in 2018. I joined in 2019, and we've been a heavy focus in exterior since then. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've added on to our Ronkonkoma location on Long Island to have a Texas location, Nevada location, and hopefully soon uh, look into some others as well. Some brief overviews into some Z-clips that we see used on the exterior side that normally we see a Z-clip used on the interior side. Um, these can be used in a non-rain screen system. So I like to show this to architects as an option where rain screens may not necessarily be needed and maybe on the first floor and maybe you know, a small panel that's just running on a small horizontal somewhere. Um, this is a stainless steel clip that we stock in clips and rails much like our other ones too. Uh, we can cut this in up to almost uh, 96 inches, and uh, we have the ability for almost all of our uh, uh, system offerings to do custom holes, and then as well as those custom links as well. Uh, on the aluminum side is a heavier gauge Z-clip that we use, again, occasionally for the exterior side, uh, mostly for interior projects, which is our 050. This is similar to sizes that we offer in some of our other aluminum systems, which is a two inch clip, a 72 inch rail and a 144 inch rail. Again, with the ability to cut and punch, and then we'll go over later a little bit uh, how we can use these also for a specific type of uh, Kyle anchor or undercut anchor, which is sometimes used in a rain screen system where you're gonna bring out the system a little bit further, but still want this half an inch projection behind the panels. We'll go into brief overviews of each cladding panel now. Uh, again, this may be a review for some uh, and an introduction to others. So feel free to hop in the chat and send any questions along the way. All these pictures are jobs to where we've added either a wall bracket behind or thermally I say wall brackets or one of our concealed or exposed fastener systems too. Uh, a brief overview on rain screen and cladding systems, a rain screen system is a drain and ventilated cavity behind exterior cladding. You could do this in a variety of ways. Some use furring strips. Uh, some use an adjustable system with aluminum like we do. They're stainless steel. But it's basically a way to bring the panel out and let the system breathe behind it at the same time. You have natural movements between the building, the panel, the aluminum system. All those components are meant to breathe and move with the system. You'll see a variety of different cladding manufacturers and panels that we'll see. Uh, some more heavy in the field than others. Uh, you can see a ton of ACM, MCM manufacturers, maybe less of an HBL and phenolic manufacturer that's big in the United States. Uh, but there's dozens of different panel types in each one with different manufacturers that make them local, national, and international as well. Uh, here's some of the ones we'll focus on today. So a brief overview, uh, we'll hop into HBL and phenolic panels. A 
a phenolic panel or an HBL panel is consisted of a core usually made with resin and cellulose fibers. So they take those, basically heat them up to extreme temperatures, compress them down and make a super strong, but also very lightweight um, panel. Uh, it's a ton of different finishes you can put on the outside of it. So if you're trying to achieve a certain look, almost any type of look can be achieved with an HBL panel. These are usually around three to five pounds per square foot. Uh, on the exterior side, 10 millimeter and 12 mill uh, millimeter are pretty popular. I have seen thinner or a little bit thicker used. Those just seem to be the most popular for exterior systems. Um, some popular ones you see will be Trespa, Fundermax, and Abbott Laminati. Uh, for those, we have concealed fastener systems of two different types. We'll go into those a little bit more later. Like I said, the TS200 was originally Trespa designed. Uh, we hold the mold for that. And we make those in-house. We also design our own, what we call our lightweight HPL line um, for projects that don't need NFPA 285 rating, maybe on a low level of a building. Uh, that TS200 one is rated for that. It's a big bulky system. It's, it's a really good system. So what we design is a lightweight system to complement that. Uh, on the exposed fastener side, we hold a, a few different ones. These are all composed of hats and J's. So again, the TS-110 is Trespa's version of a hat and J channel. F-Max is simply Funnermax. The lightweight hat and J was modeled after Abbott Laminati's. Um, we kind of made a few changes to it. And uh, uh, all of these are aluminum extruded black powder coated too, which are um, the most popular finish that we see behind a uh, uh, HBL and phenolic panel for exposed fasteners. Staying in the HBL world, but jumping over to a plank board system. Plank board panels um, can get a little bit lighter too. Um, they are a progressive system that allows you to add uh, the first layer of a um, starter rail or a trim below the system and work your way up by using planks and clips all the way up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about how our system we think has approved the install and overall um, just the system of the uh, HBL plank board panels uh, by eliminating a wood batten and adding that inch standoff that you typically like to see in a rain screen system behind the panel itself into the clip. Um, same panel manufacturers, just different systems. So you still see Trespa Fundermax, uh, Abbott Laminati, and some others that are the most popular HBL panel manufacturers also make these plank panels. Uh, some trims you'll see used a lot with these are vent screens, outside corners, occasionally inside corners, starter rails, and head rails. Jumping over to GFRC and fiber cement and fiber concrete. In our world, uh, we will see those names used interchangeably. Typically, when we talk to a GFRC or fiber cement, fiber concrete manufacturer, they distinguish big differences between the two. In our world, uh, we like to use the same type of fasteners for them. Um, with that, a, a GFRC panel, uh, which we see a lot used in the exterior world, not as much on the interior side, but but occasionally uh, those are made of architectural precast concrete. Um, so you'll see a, a, a mix of uh, elements that go into that uh, type of panel. On the other side, the fiber cement is reinforced with cellulose fiber. So just a small difference of what makes up the composition of the panels. GFRC and fiber cement, they have a lot of panel manufacturers. I've listed some of them there as their most popular, some with their own attachment systems, others where we can provide an attachment system for that. Um, and with all of these, we can always add a thermally isolated wall bracket and L-rail or T-rail behind, which brings out the, the uh, system further if you have insulation and air gap, anything like that. And we'll talk about that more as we get to it. Um, 
These go to a little bit heavier sides. We see them as little as about five to six pounds per square foot, all the way up to 14, 15 pounds per square foot. And that'll basically tell us what system we need to pair up with um, a GFRC or fiber concrete panel. Um, on the lighter side, we have something that's our lightweight system or LW1250 system, a clip and rail concealed system. On the heavier side, we go to a 1125, which is our thickest gauge aluminum system. And we also have one specially made for undercut anchors, such as the Kyle anchor as well. Uh, the exposed fastener side, you get really popular with galvanized steel, 16 and 18 gauge galvanized steel, as well as um, a black powder coated steel, hats, Z girts, and occasionally a J channel too. Natural and manufactured stone. Uh, it's pretty self explanatory, but it's a popular look. Uh, you have thousands of different types of stone finishes you can choose from. Uh, on the man-made and on the natural side, obviously with costs pending for each project, uh, we see some obviously big weight disparities, which again, can tell us what systems we need to use for that. Uh, I use uh, similar systems for this that I would a fiber cement and a GFRC panel. And that's basically because we could see a really thin stone that's only a few pounds per square foot all the way to massive amounts of 20, 30, 40 pounds per square foot, the thicker you get that stone. That'll let us know some spacing requirements that are needed with help from a structural engineer. We can give general recommendations too. Uh, porcelain is also becoming a really popular option as well um, in the cladding space. So these are thin porcelain panels that can have a mix of something like our attachment systems or a special clip that goes into grooves on the side or curve cuts on the side of the panel too, all while still being able to add a thermally isolated wall bracket or something similar behind it too to push out the system. Uh, some popular manufacturers are Castle Grande, Porcelanosa, and Florum for porcelain uh, cladding panels. Honeycomb systems, um, are starting to pick up popularity as well. That allows you to use a stone front, sometimes a metal front or different front with a honeycomb backing. Basically, that's what, 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 what that's letting you do is taking a panel that would maybe normally be a little bit heavier and get you to a point where you can make it lighter. So you get the facade that you want, the look that you want without having to have a 15 to 20 pounds per square foot panel, you've now reduced it to three, four, five pounds per square foot. Um, as it grows in popularity, we're starting to see some more honeycomb back systems on there. There's also companies that will take a thin panel and add a uh, honeycomb back to it as well. So they're just the honeycomb distributor. There's also companies that provide everything in one. We've designed a system with a specific fastener that's used for honeycomb systems. It's a mix of a mechanical bond and an adhesive bond that holds tight into the honeycomb system. That's our DN rail system that's used with the deform nut. There are some other projects you will see that use a fastener, a rivet fastener, something similar that the installer or the contractor likes to use. We'll simply use our lightweight system that I mentioned before. Terracotta, uh, one of the oldest known materials for building uh, and especially on the finishing side too. Uh, one of the heavier types of panels Terracotta, as you know, is used of weather clay or made of weather clay um, and cooked to super high temperatures. Um, you can make them into different shapes, different finishes on the outside, different colors even. Um, some popular terracotta man, uh, panel manufacturers are Boston Valley, Avenir, and NBK. Uh, you can see, a, again, a wide range of the thickness that's going to be used. The weight can change. With terracotta panels, it's um, 
similar to a couple other panel types that we see that could have their own attachment systems built into them. Some of them employ a special shape of the terracotta panel that they have clips for. Again, what we're normally seeing is in a rain screen system, they're adding some type of wall bracket or other way to push out the system a little bit to make it compliable for, or, or for a rain screen system. ACM and MCM systems are one of the most popular ones out there. Uh, for ACM and MCM, for us in specific, we typically don't have anything to attach those. Uh, we see a lot of ACM and MCM panel manufacturers having their own route and return systems. Now there are local shops that can make ACM, MCM, and others that will provide attachment systems specifically for them. They have special extrusions for them. What we found is we've been able to, again, add that uh, wall bracket behind it. These are very lightweight panels. Uh, they're usually on the more cost-effective side. We see uh, a fair amount of jobs that uh, have high dreams and high hopes and have this really nice finish that may need to be v down eventually. They'll either land on an ACM, MCM, or sometimes have to scrap the panel altogether. Um, but this seems to be a pretty good um, cost-effective option that eventually people will work their way down to. Um, they have some great finishes and great looks. There's a decent amount of um, uh, ACM and MCM panel manufacturers out there as well, too. So uh, there's some good options for those. As some miscellaneous options, uh, we'll also see some perforated metal panels. These can be used in cladding or just as decorative screens. Uh, parking garages are very popular for those. Uh, on the steel panel side, we do have some attachment systems for those. Uh, usually you want to steal the steel connection with those. So we're going, we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, and then we also see some funkier panels that have some, uh, and there's new ones being made every day of recycled material, recycled content. Um, there's some bamboo, wood, and other natural composite panels. We hope to be working with one soon um, that's used uh, ash and char as well. So it's there, there's some really cool options out there. Um, and then the last one is a curve panel. Um, there aren't too many companies that make a natural curve panel. Usually you have to take one uh, and have it rolled, have it curved to set up for that specific project uh, to go with the flow of the building or specifically on a new build if you're creating something. Uh, although we don't do that in-house, we have recommendations where we can send people. So as I mentioned before, we're gonna get into specifically our cladding attachment systems uh, and now tying back to what types of panels they can work with. This is just a general kind of flow of how we work with customers and architects when they have a project. We find the need for the panel itself and we pair them up with the uh, attachment system. So here's an overview of some of our uh, concealed fastener and towards the unexposed fastener systems. As I mentioned before, the TS-200 system, uh, that was, uh, again, originally made by Trespa. Uh, you'll see on a lot of our slides and a lot of our products, uh, we carry them in 144-inch black, mostly black, sometimes mill rails, and a combination of fixed and adjustable clips. I'm going to list it on this one and others, but I wanted to explain a little bit more with adjustable and fixed clips because um, uh, I have a lot of questions from architects and installers on the use of those. So adjustable clips are typically found on the top rail of each panel. Uh, let's say you have a panel that needs to use a rail at the top and a rail at the bottom. Uh, with that, you'll have clips incremental on the back of the panel. During install, in case you didn't get a rail perfect, a clip perfect, that adjustable bracket actually allows you to slightly lower or raise and I usually say do it on a gradual slope, uh, the panel to make it perfectly level. Um, below that, you really don't need adjustable clips. It's kind of overkill. Uh, so we see fixed clips used on any um, rows below that one. So again, your top row is almost always going to be adjustable clips. That allows you as you work from bottom to top of a panel system to adjust those as you go along. 
Uh, these are usually paired with a rivet fastener or something similar to go into the back of an HBL panel. And again, 10 to 12 millimeter are super popular for HBL on the exterior side. The MHPL system, which again was our lightweight HBL system that we design specifically for jobs that maybe don't need NFPA 285 or low level buildings. Uh, it's a great cost-effective and lightweight option. You could pair these again with almost any type of fastener. Uh, rivet fasteners are very popular for HBL and phenolic panels. And again, you'll see our note, um, 12 foot rails, two inch clips, employing both fixed and adjustable clips. We're gonna enter into our exposed fastener systems a little bit, as well as systems that can be used um, in a rain screen system to just bump off the, the, uh, the panel in the system another inch. So these can be used behind a concealed fastener system. More often than not, we're seeing them used as an exposed fastener system to where face fasten screws, and usually they're painted as well, are drilled through the panel. Normally they're supplied with holes, so through the panel and into these systems to hold into place. So you get your total depth of one inch or greater. So allowing for flow and movement behind the back of the panel. Uh, in this particular case, we have originally designed Trespa hats and J's. These are both black powder coated. Um, all of these are stock products that we have on the shelf, those concealed fasteners and exposed fasteners. The orientation of how these are laid out is going to be uh, uh, really determined by how it's being used in that situation. On an exposed fastener, you'll typically see the base, which is that three and a quarter of the hat, go to the substrate or the wall, and panels are screwed into the uh, legs on both sides. On something that's going to be just a bump out with maybe a concealed, you'll see those legs go to the wall or the substrate. The base is usually going to have a concealed fastener or maybe a different type of exposed fastener coming off of it. And I'll show you just a couple more options. These are all hat channels and J channels, originally designed for Funder Max for these. So an F Max hat and J, still black powder coated. And going to a lighter version that we created is our lightweight hat and J. Again, still black powder coated aluminum, something that we stock. So all different options of black powder coated extruded aluminum that we keep in stock specifically for these types of projects. All right, going back into our concealed fastener systems a little bit more. So concealed fastener rail and clip system, which is our 1125. Like we talked about before, when we talked about stone and some GFRC panels, these are typically used for pretty heavy panel types. I normally see it used eight, nine, 10 pounds per square foot and heavier. So a concealed fastener system, just like the others with adjustable clips on top, fixed brackets below. With this one particularly, you wanna make sure that you have a flat surface on the back of the panel to mount to. Um, the reason I bring this up is because some anchors that I'll show you actually have a little bit extra material that comes out the back of the panel. Uh, we don't want this. We want this whole clip sitting up against the back of the panel to provide as much hold as possible without any wiggle on the clip too. Uh, one of the more popular systems we like to use for stone, a little bit of GFRC and fiber cement is called a keep nut. This leaves a flat surface in the back of the panel mount too. It's a strong uh, anchor we'll talk about a little bit more that has teeth that dig into, metal teeth that dig into the stone and hold into place once you insert a screw into it. The LW1250 system that I've mentioned a few times before, uh, this is a lightweight system. 
uh, used on a lighter weight GFRC fiber cement panel, occasionally on a honeycomb panel. Uh, I've even used it on uh, uh, an HBL phenolic panel, a lightweight wood panel. Um, again, we want to see that flat surface on the back of the panel to mount to. No anchors coming out the back of it. We want to hold as possible as much as possible to that back of the panel. Uh, we again will use the keep nut for this one or any standard anchor. Uh, the UC rail and the UC clip is, uh, to put it very easily, UC stands for undercut. Uh, these are used for undercut anchors. Uh, we work with a Kyle anchor a lot. I uh, have seen others on the market as well. Uh, the reason this one is special, more special than the other ones, is because of this little part of the clip right here. With the Kyle anchor, there's actually a little hex head that comes out the top. This undercut anchor bores a hole into the bottom, holds tight into there. What we've designed in, uh, and we can compromise uh, a couple of our uh, systems by adding a hex hole. We wanted to use this one specifically because instead of a hex hole, this clip has a little indent in it to hold as tight to the back of the panel as possible. We've also added a neoprene pad on most of ours too. It eases with install, helps with natural variations of stone or other types of panels that may not be perfectly flat on the backside. Again, adjustable and fixed clips. We stock these in 12 foot rails and inch and a half clips. Uh, another use for the uh, pad that you see there is uh, you'll want uh, to prevent any galvanic corrosion eventually between the aluminum and possibly a natural stone, sometimes a man-made stone. This will allow a little bit barrier between the two as well. So two to three reasons why adding that neoprene pad is good for that one. The DN rail, as I mentioned before, was specifically designed for the deform nut in honeycomb panels. Um, you'll see again, kind of similar to the UC rail and UC clip, that deform nut actually has a little bit of extra material that holds onto the back of the panel. After it's inserted and everything, uh, the adhesive is added. That bolt will hold it into place, but we get a, a maximum amount of clip on the back of the panel to hold it tight. While the deform nut is uh, a multi-step process to install. We found that it's the best uh, type of anchor and fastening system specifically for a honeycomb panel. So we've incorporated that into the DN clip and DN rail system. Wrapping up on the concealed fastener clip and rail systems is a stainless steel system that we designed. Uh, we can make these in 304 stainless steel, 316 stainless steel, and uh, a couple different gauges as well, depending on the weight of your panel. We'll see a lot of um, customers use this for steel. They'll either weld it or do some type of uh, special adhesive to the back of it to get the clip to uh, hold to the back of the panel. When you're talking about a steel panel that's super thin, you can't use traditional mechanical manufacturer or uh, fasteners. So. Um, while we can use this with a bunch of different types of heavier panels uh, with steel, you kind of lose the ability to um, use a mechanical fastener. So we're talking adhesive or welding for the clip to the back of the panel. Uh, with 11 gauge, we can make these up to uh, 96 inches, 16 gauge up to 120 inches. And again, we have fixed and adjustable brackets for both. Our MFTP system, so a Tress Papyrus system, was designed, as I mentioned before, as a plank system. But instead of using wood furring on the entire project, our clip is incorporated a one inch standoff into it, which saves on install and cost of material. Uh, we pair that up with the same trims that uh, are typically found with the Tress Papyrus system. 
So you can see event screen, inside corner, outside corner, and some edge trim as well. Uh, we really love the design of the one inch standoff. Uh, we've done some tests on uh, how much time it can save uh, for installers to uh, use that instead of having to put up wood furring strips and then with the cost of wood as well. It's just huge to have one clip instead of a clip wood furring strips and install for everything. Going into the meat of uh, a cladding system is a thermally isolated, isolated wall bracket. Um, these wall brackets with adjustable L rails, uh, we show them here with the Kyle Anchor system, the, uh, the UC rail, UC clip system. It can be used with a concealed fastener system, exposed fastener system. And um, while we're on this screen, I can show you guys uh, a couple of different components that we like of these. Um, for mounting back to the substrate, you'll see a couple different holes. We have small circular holes, which are typically used with metal studs, steel studs, and wood. These bigger holes on the single and double brackets will be used with concrete and CMU anchors. Holes that you see going towards the L rail are either oblong or circular shaped. Circular typically used for um, dead bolting into the L rail. You'll see that used once, maybe twice per L rail. That's a dead bracket to hold it into place. In other areas, you want some natural movement with wind load and with the expansion contraction of the building and the system itself. We use those oblong holes, which will allow for that to move throughout the system. If you lock too many into place, you eventually could get to a point where you're getting stress fractures, cracks, uh, bowings in the panel because they're not allowing the whole system to naturally move like it would like to. Here we see vertical brackets. Here's a horizontal bracket with an exposed fastener system. We make these out of 6061 aluminum, uh, which is a pretty structural aluminum. Uh, using the two, three, four, and five inch depths with adjustability, we can accommodate anywhere from a two inch to a six and a half inch gap, which from what I've seen covers 90% plus of projects that I've run into. Um, that doesn't include any concealed or exposed fastener system that you're bringing off of it as well. So in total, uh, you could get these easily to seven plus inches. Uh, we stock L and T rails and mill finish and black powder coated specifically for these wall brackets. Our smaller wall or L rails are used for our smallest wall bracket and the bigger L rail is used for the three, four and five inch. Uh, with vertical and horizontal, or sorry, vertical and uh, single and double wall brackets. Singles are typically used for wind load. Uh, although with the holes in them, you can switch it. Structural engineers will usually give their recommendations on that. A double is typically used for a dead load bracket. As a general rule of thumb, it ends up being about one double per L rail, uh, give or take. Uh, some spacing that you'll see is what we found is a general recommendation, 36 inches, three feet on center is pretty typical with wall bracket spacing. You could see up to 48 inches plus and go down as low as 24 inches. That's gonna depend on the weight of the panel and some other determining factors of the project itself. Uh, L rails can be spaced with the studs. I've seen them as far spacing as skipping studs or going 24 inches on center for CMU and concrete. Again, a lot of the project details are gonna tell us what our recommendations are gonna be later on confirmed or if need to be updated by a structural engineer. For all of these wall brackets, horizontal, vertical, we stock them with the uh, thermal pad already attached to them uh, so that when they are delivered to site or to the warehouse project that you're working on, uh, they will be attached already. So we have structural calculations for those as well as a thermal report for these wall brackets to include um, with all the information on the system, 
for an architect to use, and then also for calculations that a structural engineer is doing. Uh, later this year, we're hoping to uh, launch our wall bracket calculator that will allow architects to go in and determine spacing based off of um, some of the project specifics that they can provide. Uh, we can briefly uh, go into some of the hardware and we'll wrap up after that. Uh, these are just some of the more popular ones that we've covered uh, that we see used on a pretty regular basis. Uh, that Kyle anchor is, again, a super strong undercut anchor that we'll see used with uh, our UC rail system or retrofit to use our 050 system that I showed you in the beginning or a 1125 system. The keep nut, which I talked about before with those metal teeth that hold into a stone GFRC, some type of hard panel surface. All of these have a special drill that you can use to drill that hole in there and then insert these, um, as well as the deform nut, which has that, and then adhesive that's used specifically for holding into those honeycomb panels. Um, with the deform nut specifically used for honeycomb panels and the keep nut and Kyle anchor being used for a multiple uh, array of different panels. To wrap up adhesive systems, what we're seeing is taking off a little bit more. That's really big in Europe. We think it's gonna start making its way over and getting more popular. Um, something for an adhesive system that we think is gonna be uh, really popular coming up here soon is using a wall bracket with a T-rail. That then takes the place of an exposed fastener. So instead of using mechanical fasteners, you've now turned your exposed fastener system into a concealed fastener system that's using an adhesive. So you would have adhesive on the T-rails uh, and then adhering your panels directly to that has now turned into a concealed fastener system that is rain screen ready. I made a little flow chart in case anybody has questions at the end, uh, if they want this presentation or would like more information on our stuff. It's a pretty handy thing that we use uh, for uh, new employees here, but also we see uh, architects seem to like it, especially if they're working with us on a regular basis. What they can see there is what system is being used, what panel manufacturer panel type is being used down to what type of um, anchor or fastener, connect that with our concealed fastener system, and then a brief overview about wall brackets as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Jared. That was really great. Um, great diagram at the end, too. So um, we will have a recording of this uploaded onto Ace Lab, so y'all will be able to access the presentation there. Um, but I'm also going to launch a quick poll here, so that'll let you let us know if you're interested in receiving follow-up information. Um, please just fill this out real quick, and then we can make sure to connect you with the right person from the Monarch <laughs> team. Um, all right, seems like we've got a few questions coming in. So David asks, how long has the adhesive system been in use? Um, so David, we are, we're working with a couple of different adhesive suppliers right now to really fine tune what we're gonna offer. So we currently are not, We've not had any projects hit yet. Uh, we're, I've personally been kind of waiting on the market to come to us, um, but we have a couple of adhesive options and that adhesive option, uh, like Jared mentioned, is a, a wall bracket, so adjustable for plumb and in and out uh, with a T-rail or an L-rail. That allows you to have enough surface area for both adhesive and like a, a 3M VHB style tape for your initial tack. So we're, we're, I'm very excited personally about that about that system. I think it's going to um, allow for a much faster installation, um, lower labor quality, um, and just just fast use thinner materials. So we're really excited about it, and hopefully have something ready to go by the end of the year. Great. And I see a question from Patricia. It seems like this is about maybe a specific detail that was shown. Um, but asking what are the materials that have the dashed lines and also the dotted material. Um, so I'm not sure if you know what that is referencing, but Patricia, maybe give us a little bit more uh, context if you can. Um, 
I also want to mention that if anyone would like to ask a question out loud, um, please feel free to raise your hand. I will unmute you. You don't have to turn your camera on. Um, but if you have a question that feels project specific or a bit longer form for the chat, um, feel free to raise your hand and we would love to hear from you. All right. So like we've got some thank yous, great presentation, which is awesome. I'm gonna look through these ones that were answered and see if any of them might be good just to chat about out loud. I can answer Todd's question on here. Um, uh, the question is, do you know what temperature tolerance there is for the adhesives for both install and overall performance? Um, there are a couple of different families of adhesives and tapes, and you'd have different tapes and adhesives for different conditions. So an installation in Canada would look very different than an installation in Texas. Um, so you're going to have to have adhesives that are going to be able to perform and install at various temps. So um, that adhesive and tape side of the equation would have to be really thought through prior to installation. So um, that also has to do with the panel makeup. You know, if you have a panel that's going to soak up that thermal energy and get very, very hot in the sun, the adhesive is going to have to react to that as well. It's much akin to metal roofing where you have to select the right membrane. So it all has to be done as a total system and thought through. Trissa says that um, they got their answers. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we'll I that. saw a question from uh, Christian, which is a, a good question uh, on whether we provide panels or not. Um, so we don't provide any panels themselves. Uh, we wanted to stay out of the panel business. We want to be a help for panel manufacturers, suppliers, and distributors by providing an attachment system uh, for their panels. Uh, so we work with almost any type of panel manufacturer, um, kind of like how I mentioned in there, there's only a few different types of panels that we don't have specific concealed or exposed fastener systems uh, systems for. What we can add is, is a thermally isolated wall bracket or something similar behind that to uh, on any projects that are using a, uh, a thermal insulation, uh, a larger air gap or a thermal break in there. Um, oh, and Karen asked about, um, are any of these systems approved by the California Division of the State uh, Architect for use? Um, and I'm seeing that that was a, a new question for you guys, um, but mm -hmm. that Karen also said uh, to feel free to contact them directly if you find an answer. So um, we will definitely look into that and follow up with you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, as far as I know, we yeah. did have one project where the uh, 1125 system was approved. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, I, I, like Aaron said, I'd, I'd have to look into it a little bit more. Um, that was the one I know for sure, uh, the concealed fastener system that was. Cool. All right. And then Patricia says, I guess my only question would be, how is exterior board insulation, say, three inches deep taken into consideration? So you can handle that a variety of ways. And it generally has to come, it comes down to project costs, labor costs. Um, and some of the weight capacity that you're going to have, um, you know, the cheapest, simplest, dirtiest, least energy efficient way is to use continuous Z girts or hat channels to space the cladding off of the insulation. Those are made um, typically at insulation depth, so a three inch Z for a three inch insulation. Um, a better thermal performance model, but higher cost is going to use um, are wall brackets. And those wall brackets have a thermal isolating pad on the back, and then they're attached um, to the wall. And then you have L rails and T rails that build the substructure out past the insulation. One of the nice benefits about that is you can build your rain screen gap into those pretty quickly and still have um, a lot of adjustability. Um, you can plumb and really dial in the plane of your wall without any uh, imperfections from the wall substrate out. So that's the two kind of methods, but there are a variety of ways you can achieve that. Um, but those are the two base methods that we recommend. I also wanna quickly let folks know that um, as you leave the webinar, there will be a quick survey, just like one or two questions. If you can provide any feedback about today's event, um, that's super helpful for us. Um, so yeah, I would appreciate anyone who is able to fill out that survey as you're leaving today. All right. Cool. Let's see, 
put in another call for questions if anyone else has something that they would like to get answered now. Um, and also, again, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask something out loud. Um, and one more reminder about that poll, um, feel free to express your interest there if you're looking to get any follow-up info, and we'll be sure to uh, connect you after today's webinar. See, looks like no more questions, just some thank yous, which is awesome. Um, is there anything else that uh, you guys wanted to touch on today before um, I could let folks go a bit early? No, I appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, obviously uh, use Ace Lab, reach out to us directly, mm -hmm. and uh, if we can provide them for uh, project specific questions or just in general if you want more information. Great. Awesome. Yeah. If, like Jared said, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, we love working with customers and figuring out the right tailored solution for your for your project, um, for your product line. If you have any ideas, let us know. We like we love working with people, so let us know how we can help. Yeah, totally. I can attest that uh, the Monarch team is super great to work with. So definitely reach out if you've got questions, um, if you've got a project and you're you know not sure. Um, they're great people to uh, get advice from and to work with. So. Feel free to use Ace Lab to reach out. Um, and if anyone has questions about doing so, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is just bo at acelabusa.com. If you registered for today's webinar, I'm sure you have it somewhere in your inbox. Um, so if you have any questions about getting in touch with Monarch or about today's webinar, you can feel free to reach out to me as well, and I will forward them over to the Monarch team. All right, cool. Well, let's let folks go a few minutes early today, um, seeing a lot of thank yous. So I want to thank everyone in our audience today for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, please uh, feel free to fill out that survey if you have a moment. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and end our poll now. So last call for like one last response if anybody needs to. But if not, then we will go ahead and end the webinar for today. Thank you again, Aaron and Jared. Um, this was a great presentation. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Bye.